let's say create incentives to share data while not losing control so with this let me go over to Ma Ma Marilia Marilia Maciel is a head of digital commerce and internet policy at Diplo Foundation and uh, so in your view what are the effects of digital and data governance uh, on the trade sector on the international level where do you see limitations on the discussions on data governance in the trade space and uh, as you were part of the working group on improvement of the IGF and with this experience in mind how do you think the discussion on digital self-determination and data governance fits as we are moving forward with this work what is already existing uh, in terms of governance processes and what fora could be leveraged thank you very much Marilia. Could somebody unmute uh, Marilia Maciel? Thank you. Marilia Maciel, she's in the middle of our screen, the one that is pointing her finger. Yes, yes, that's her. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone uh, on site and online. It's a pleasure to be here representing Diplo and the Geneva Internet Platform in this uh, discussion. Many, many interesting questions. Well, first of all, I think that we need to establish that uh, data and data governance, they are key to trade discussions today. Um, first, data is an enabler of trade. So in the context of a digitalized economy, um, data is key for processing online payments, for providing information to consumers, uh, for logistics, track tracking after sales uh, activities. And at the same time, Packets of data may carry the digitized version of products uh, which are being commercialized. Let's think about uh, ebooks, music streaming, software, for example. And finally, we see an increasing number of hybrid products, which are basically products, uh, goods that have embedded services in them. Let's think, for instance, of an Apple Watch. So the bulk of the value added uh, lies not on the watch itself, but on the services which are heavily reliant uh, on data that the watch carries. So as the digital economy matures from a governance perspective, it's interesting to see that regulation has moved uh, from protecting data as intellectual property and excluding others from using it to a focus on promoting safe, transparent, trustworthy mechanisms for data sharing um, as a way to unlock the value of data today. So nationally, data spaces and the proposal that has been advanced by Switzerland is an example of this shift. And internationally, we see that more and more countries are fostering principles such as uh, data free flows with trust, which is an idea that has been championed by Japan and carried forward by the G20. Um, data flows have also been included in uh, free trade agreements and in the context of e-commerce negotiations in the WTO, which aim to reach a plurilateral binding agreement. So what we see today at the international level is that while we are discussing about data governance in digital policy spaces, data governance is being done um, via uh, plurilateral agreements, via trade agreements. And what do these agreements say about data? Well, first of all, they try to establish uh, a principle uh, between the contracting parties, a general principle that says that data should flow freely uh, across borders. And at the same time, they aim to define very narrowly or, or as narrowly as possible the exceptions to this principle of uh, free data flows, such as, for instance, to protect privacy and data protection or uh, when there's an issue of uh, national security uh, involved. But there are some very important limitations when it comes to tackling data and data governance purely from a trade perspective. Um, so far, these discussions in the trade area have had little consideration for the role that data plays on industrial policies and on development. So there are no exceptions today seeking to protect the policy space of governments that aim to impose certain limits on free data flows, uh, aiming to exploit data to produce value within the national territory. So development considerations have been very scant. Another very important limitation is that 
uh, from a data when when we discuss data from a trade uh, perspective there is a lot of data flowing through the internet that is not necessarily trade related let's think for instance uh, about machine to machine um, communication um, so regulation when it's done from a trade perspective it risks to be over comprehensive and to regulate data that is not trade related data and data is a cross cutting multidisciplinary topic which has implications in other areas such as human rights privacy freedom of expression freedom from discri discrimination competition and so on so our trade negotiations uh, apt to identify these uh, other areas and to deal with these connections between different areas. This is a question that we need to ask ourselves. And because data is fundamental and relevant, not only for businesses, but also for individuals, are trade negotiations the best place to build trust between governments, businesses and individuals that we have been discussing in this session. First of all, we need transparency. We have all said that and trade negotiations today, they are very opaque. We don't know what's going on. The proposals are not published on the website of the WTO, for instance. So we have an idea of what is being discussed, but we don't know the direction that negotiations are moving. Um, there is no participation from non-governmental actors. So trade negotiations, they are governmentally driven and only governments participate in negotiations. Only governments are in the meeting room. Therefore, the whole idea of multi-stakeholder involvement gets uh, lost. Um, and they, when we uh, look at the trade discussions today, uh, because they are focused on trade and do, they do not take into account other issues such as human rights, for instance, I tend to think that we need another home to discuss the data governance, a home that could be uh, harbored in a UN structure. Uh, this is an idea that has been advanced by Jungtad in a very good report that they published at the end of last year. Uh, where to park these discussions? Perhaps I should uh, stop here, uh, not to be normative, but to let other people come in and perhaps have their own ideas where this could be taken um, in the UN if there's a space in the UN to discuss these issues. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much, Marilia. So um, all those who are looking for a space to discuss various aspects of data governance, data is already discussed and decisions are taken, but basically mainly um, from a trade perspective. And this is something that many people sometimes forget. And it's very, it's very good that you hinted us at this and that hopefully then will be picked up in the discussion about where else maybe should data be discussed, should principles and rules be developed. With this, uh, uh, let me give a hand over to uh, Roger Dubach. He's ambassador and the deputy director of the direct, uh, Directorate of International Law at the Swiss uh, Foreign uh, uh, Ministry. And uh, Roger, you have been uh, working on this report together with us, and you're one of the key drivers also to try and, and place this issue uh, in the international environment. Um, so. Um, nationally we're drafting now a code of conduct for trustworthy data spaces but how do we connect how does do such national efforts tie in with international governance mechanisms how do we ensure that such efforts do not contribute to further regulatory fragmentation if everything is done on national level how can we create a positive agenda for a future global um, framework over to you Roger. thank you very much uh, thomas um, yeah, I mean, I would like to start with uh, one one thought about what does it mean digital self-determination and governance, and um, I think it's very important to to start with that. That saying, somehow, we realize that it's very difficult to go directly from the idea of digital self-determination to to the global governance discussion on on data. And so somehow uh, we identified, I mean, together that um, it's very good to start with the data spaces and that we try to see how digital self-determination can take form within a data space. And at the very beginning, when we were talking together about data spaces, there was not that much uh, talking about the governance. Uh, it was just, it was more, how can we operationalize a data space? And finally, uh, we realized that talking about 
interoperability between data spaces or how to build data spaces and make them interoperable that then you are completely within the governance uh, discussion and so um, as you already mentioned Thomas the report we have produced for the government there we suggested uh, to draft the kind of code of conduct on a national level uh, which is uh, will be on a voluntary basis uh, that we try to to figure out okay uh, what are the key principles to build trustworthy data spaces which are uh, based on digital self-determination and we are working on that the the key principles you you have mentioned them in the beginning in your introductory remarks and so we are with this code of conduct aiming at build trustworthy and human-centered uh, uh, data spaces and one thing it, which is very important have been already said by my previous speakers is that we definitely want to overcome this kind of dichotomy between privacy and data use or uh, data protection and data use now what does it mean for the international context uh, first of all uh, on a national level we have built a kind of a network a national network for producing uh, this code of conduct and in parallel we are establishing an international uh, network for doing the same on an international level and we see now uh, the, the approach for a national code of conduct very much as a kind of a contribution to the international discussion so it should not be a kind of a fragmentation not at all but more the con on, on the contrary that um, the the national discussion we have and we will suggest something for the international discussion with the international network we are also discussing this idea of trustworthy data spaces how to build them um, and so there should be a kind of pinpointing and uh, back and forth between the national and international level uh, and our idea is also to include the international discussion or the, the international um, thinking on how to uh, establish trustworthy data spaces within the national code of conduct so i personally hope that the, today's discussion will also bring some more insights for us for the, the, the work we are doing on a national level and of course uh, discussions like today are very important for starting the, the international discussion on trustworthy data spaces. I think that uh, the thing which is lacking and I think that's we are, what we are discussing uh, today is now where could we have those discussions because finally what we like would like to achieve is So we seem to have lost uh, Roger. Maybe he'll come. He'll come in later. But I think what he was going to say is that what we would like to achieve is that we, first of all, all stakeholders together. That what we what we did, uh, creating a multi-stakeholder network on national level. That not just one, but many networks uh, emerge and continue to emerge on international level that involve as many stakeholders as possible so that we get to a global understanding that is complementary to what is happening in the trade sector, but that picks up also the other the other aspects that are as important as we've heard. So if Roger doesn't come back, I'm sure he will participate in the discussion. Let me move over to a last speaker and then we'll, we'll open the floor. Um, we have a uh, welcoming uh, Pari, Pari Estefani. She's the co-founder and president of the Global Technopolitics uh, Forum. And Pari, um, as you have been also reflecting on the question of data governance, which is controversial, how does the geopolitical landscape that we are witnessing, uh, have been witnessing increasingly uh, with increasing tension, influence this discussion? Is there a chance for an international agreement on this issue, or at least on where to discuss this issue in a more holistic way in the current political climate? 
If yes, in what format should these discussions take place? If not, what we do? I see Roger, you're back. I hand it over to Pari, but I'm sure you will participate in the discussion if, if that's okay for you. So Pari, how do we get to shared principles on, on data governance in the current geopolitical environment? Thank you for your reflections and insights. If you could unmute Pari Stefani, that would be nice. We are getting there, I think. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking IGF for this timely debate and all the work that you guys have done. So as we all uh, realize, uh, as governments became aware of the economic value of data, it became a geopolitical concern. Today, how data is controlled, collected, stored, protected, used and transferred over uh, national borders all has become geopolitical you know, issues and concern. Inevitably, its governance runs into the differences in ideological regions of the internet and fundamental cultural divides. Conceptions range from Washington's market-based internet with a motto that if data is the new oil, then let's drill it. There is the EU's approach that wants to regulate uh, if they could figure out how, and then there is the Beijing authoritarian vision that we are going to control this as we control everything else. So there are also cultural differences between various countries that influence their policies and approaches. For example, privacy has different meaning in China, in United States, in Europe, and even between allies like Europe and United States, we see that the uh, emphasis put on issues the first. For example, U.S. emphasized freedom of speech when we see that EU uh, emphasized privacy. So we have to allow for these, uh, which adds another layer of complexity. Another issue to consider is that over the last few decades, the global context has moved from a neatly organized Cold War uh, between two superpowers mainly Russia and its allies in one side and United States and its allies on the other side with very limited interaction between the two sides to a global village with relatively open borders and dependable economies. It's a multi-power context where China is a superpower, but there is also there are also other rising powers, such as India, which interestingly remains poor, but technologically pretty sophisticated. Then we have the private sector, who envision the frontiers of the internet and collects data with revenue much larger than many countries' GDP. Then during pandemic, we saw the geopolitical power of local governments as cities created their own uh, global networks. Add to this the civil society, which is becoming far more visible and influential force in the global scene. So we are living in a very different world. Now, when it comes to geopolitics, alliances matter. And while the democratic lines are very visible, alliances are far more complex and opportunistic. So digital deciders, those countries that have not aligned firmly, matter. So we also should realize that global data and internet governance represent a scattered multi-stakeholder bottom-up and driven by loose coordination among various players. Data governance can be thought of as a, um, as a incorporating a triangle of individuals and their privacy, nation states and their interests, and private sector and its profits. So adding to this complexity that I'm trying to describe, there's also issues in governing the digital domain overlap, cut across policy areas and even conflicts. For example, a force to safeguard privacy conflicts with national security requirements, digital trade 
uh, touches on all other policy areas and conflicts with some laws, standards and norms that are required to safeguard universal values or global and national interests, such as the environment, human rights, privacy, and could limit the scope of uh, free digital trade. So now bring this to the complex geopolitical scene. And it's clear that a single overarching governance regime for data as essential as it maybe seems unlikely anytime soon. A good deal of fragmentation exists now and is likely to persist. Adding to the complexity is the Internet's extremely volatile ecosystem given rapid technological changes. However, those same characteristics that makes it difficult to govern offer flexibility and adaptability, which are critical in this complex context where many actors with different interests are interacting. It permits actor, actors to cooperate in some area despite disagreements in others and enables them to adjust to uncertainty. In this situation, I believe that agreements on principles become an essential, which uh, Maria was explaining uh, that in trade they are agreeing on principle. So I think it's an essential starting point and establishing a regime, a critical move. I will stop here and because it seems I'm running over time, but there is a lot to discuss and I hope I can come back and add more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pari, for this uh, very interesting contribution and also for uh, hinting at um, that uh, the internet and the way it's set up and, and the number of, of uh, layers above it actually allow for interaction, interoperability, despite, let's say, some difference at least, and that, that there is hope that although we may not agree in the, in the near future on, 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 on fundamental principles on, on, on global data governance, but cooperation is still possible, is still happening. Um, with this, um, let me uh, open the floor to all of you uh, present here in the room and also online. For those online, please raise your hands and because I don't see the Zoom room uh, when somebody is speaking, so I would hope that the technicians and Livia, whoever else, point uh, to me when, when hands are raised. Um, so please, um, what, what do you think of what you heard? How do we how do we move on to make sure that data is more used, is that the potential of data is, is actually seized, um, but at the same time while leaving the control over their data to people, while empowering people that they can uh, take decisions on their own on, on how and what for their data is used. What do we need to do in particular on an international level? How can we move this forward? That's the question to all of you. Um, who would like to start reacting? I can start by adding that multi-stakeholder, I believe, is the answer. At the moment, in many of the actions, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So at the moment, often uh, other actors are uh, used in a consultation. I think there is need to incorporate them for more than just in the consultation uh, level. But even that's a very good start. But the key, I think, for progress is to recognizing that these other actors matter. They are the ones who are envisioning the uh, frontiers of the uh, innovation. And it's important to bring them into this space and communicate with them. So that's, I think, one of the problems I see is that the space remains dominated by governments and we see little input from other actors. That I think, and also uh, when I talk about actors, I'm not talking, uh, I think it's also important to bring governments from developing world in an equal basis. So that uh, democratization of space matters for discussion and policy making. That's one area that I like to emphasize. Thank you very much, Pari. Comments, questions? Who 
Bertrand has his hand up. I'm told, Bertrand, please go ahead. And after Bertrand, uh, since we are here on the African continent, of course, I think it is interesting to hear also, especially from, from people from this continent, um, what are your needs, what are your, what is necessary on international level to also make sure that, that people, uh, businesses in Africa can benefit from sharing of data. So just uh, as a reminder to all, Bertrand, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so I'm Bertrand Le Chapelle. I'm the uh, Chief Vision Officer of the Data Sphere Initiative, and it was great to have uh, Magdalena uh, speaking on this. I want just to insert one element, which is we are seeing at the moment a proliferation of expressions such as um, data unions, data commons, data collectives, data collaboratives, data cooperatives, fiduciaries, trust, etc. We can put that under a single umbrella, which is basically data communities and how they organize themselves. And it connects with the notion of data spaces and connects to the notion of digital self-determination. One of the things that we think uh, the Data Sphere Initiative is important is to look at how those different data communities organize themselves internally and how they organize their relationship with other data communities. And so this is why we are uh, pushing the notion of developing beyond the codes of conduct or the general overarching principles, the notion of charter templates for um, such data communities so that it organizes who participates in this data community. What are the rules of behavior within a particular uh, structure? What is the distribution of responsibilities? What is the type of data? that is being shared and what is the purpose of such a, a data community. And in parallel, that's for the internal organization and it includes the distribution of value within the community on what is produced by the sharing of data. There is also a need to develop something that is a little bit inspired by the, um, the concept of creative commons of can we develop licenses that are machine operate, uh, implementable that would allow different data communities to organize in a structured manner the exchange of data in a trusted environment and also make the barrier for cooperation and the barrier for sharing as low as possible in a uh, way that is uh, respectful of all the different rights and protections. And that's the reason why we place this under the concept of self-determination and self-organization and at the same time under the um, overarching mission and vision that is pushed by the Data Sphere Initiative, which is to responsibly unlock the value of data for all so that we can address both personal and non-personal data. We can develop both social and economic value and we can make sure that there is more data that is made accessible than some of the restrictions that are put in place, but at the same time, it's done with the sufficient protections to avoid the negative impacts of sharing without sufficient frameworks. So this notion of developing charters for data communities and licenses for the relationship between data communities, especially cross borders, is one of the key uh, ways to implement the notion of digital self-determination so that the whole data um, society is a data-driven society is built from the bottom up through the proliferation of a very large number of data communities that uh, responsibly unlock the value of data for all. Thank you very much, Bertrand, for um, introducing this notion of, of uh, charters for data communities. Further comments, questions? From the room, let me take uh, two from the first the lady here next to me. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I am Sinjinea Cantanhede. I'm part of the youth program in Brazil, and I'm also a data protection officer at an education NGO. And I would like to deliver a question to Marília, but also welcoming answers on how we can use data to understand the back between minorities. For example, in education research, where we try to understand the lack in gender or the lack in race in access to education, how we can make this information useful to understand the challenges that we have in providing 
equal access, but also how is it possible to make this more security for population, especially population who are already in vulnerabilities? Thank you. Thank you very much. So you have been asked, invited to answer Marilia. So if the technician could unmute Marilia so that she can respond to that question. I can unmute myself now. Thank you. Thank you for this question. It falls a little bit uh, beyond my remit, but I think I can uh, share a few ideas. I think that the first gap that we have uh, is uh, mechanisms for data management, uh, measurement, um, and we use certain proxies to measure data that flows across borders, such as international bandwidth that are not uh, very precise. So even thinking in the broader terms about the digital economy, we need to improve uh, the measurements that we have in terms of data flows to understand where data is flowing from, where data is flowing to, uh, what kind of uh, data we are talking about, so we have a better idea of what is the trade data, for instance, and what is not. Uh, going one level uh, down and, and to your question when it comes to certain types of data, I think one, of, one connection that we need to make more strongly is how data can uh, support uh, the SDGs. I think that we force ourselves to think about that when we write our IGF proposals, but there's, there's a very interesting discussion um, going on in the broader UN system about uh, the SDGs and uh, data has not been specifically mentioned, but it has been included in the conversations after that. So data for better policy making, for better planning and uh, data that really, really uh, fine tunes information about certain uh, ages, uh, information about gender. This is something that uh, those that collect data need to be much more sensitized uh, to that, not only governments, but the private sector um, as well, because we can only work with uh, better policy making and to design better policies if we have this data that is uh, granular and that is broken down and segmented uh, at hand. In trade, we see that. We say a lot that trade helps uh, SMEs and e-commerce is very important for gender inclusion. However, we still lack data many times to back that up and to design really national policies to support that on the grassroots level. So that's a very important point. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you, Marilia. Um, I have seen another hand up from the person in red, the lady. Please go uh, move forward to the microphone and then I, I see another hand up then on the remote participants. Push the button and then it will turn from green to red. Yes. Hi, uh, hi. my name is Judith Moaya. I'm with the Tony Blair Institute. Uh, my question really is around the, the, the comment that was made by one of the speakers, I don't remember who exactly, um, around using or leveraging trade agreements to discuss cross-border data flows or to discuss data governance as a whole. Um, I think looking at the context in Africa, we had in 2014 a Malabo conven convention which was meant to harmonize data uh, policies and data um, uh, laws across Africa, but it was not signed by many countries. I think uh, until this point, only 13 or 14 countries have signed that that agreement but now that with the afta the africa continental free trade area coming into into action we are seeing more countries wanting to develop their own um data policy frameworks their own data laws in order to participate in this trade so in a way they're using trade our trade is an incentive for them to participate in developing their own local or national level frameworks so i just want to understand wh where you're coming from when you're saying that you know maybe you know, trade agreements are not the, the right avenue, given that, again, to, to act, governments need incentives. And trade, for example, the AFTA is a great incentive for African governments to leverage for their own economic development. And, and therefore, they are working towards building these, these, these uh, uh, laws to support that. So that's my question. I don't remember the, the person that asked, uh, made that comment. So if, you could, if they remember, maybe they can come on and just uh, speak to that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, it was Marilia, if I'm not, not mistaken. So that's a very good, challenging uh, question. What is the problem? Isn't, isn't it good that at least in trade agreements we do have uh, some data policy governance ideas reflected? Thank you Mar for this question. It's a very good uh, question. And uh, you were right that many times 
trade provides incentives to governments officials to, to join the conversation because it's something that is more concrete uh, to them. And there's no problem in discussing um, data uh, in trade conversations. I think it's even inevitable to do that. I think there are two points that we need to bear in mind. One of them is that there's a lot of uh, knowledge uh, that has been developed in other spaces that could be fed into trade conversations. So e-commerce discussions at the WTO, for instance, they are discussing privacy and data protection. We have a convention at the international level uh, celebrated within the Council of Europe, Convention 108, that is open to, to, to non-European uh, countries to join. So instead of starting discussions from scratch, why are we not inviting uh, countries to join this convention that provides a good framework of data protection? Network neutrality is another example. In the IGF, we had a dynamic coalition on network neutrality that has come forward with a model law on network neutrality that could be extremely relevant for trade negotiators to take into account. However, if you talk to negotiators at the WTO, they will tell you, oh, network neutrality, which they call open internet access. This is a very easy topic. This is one of the topics that we're going to negotiate in the first months and it will be over soon. And we know how divisive network neutrality has been. So this model law could provide a good blueprint for negotiations, but they are not aware of it. So these bridges, they need to be built. Um, and certain topics we need to be aware that when we discuss uh, in a trade table we invert the logic so think about privacy and data protection if you are at the council of europe which is a human rights organization you will discuss this as the end goal no matter what you do you are there to protect privacy in a trade conversation when they discuss privacy they will try to come up with a solution that will harm trade the most because their end goal is to promote trade liberalization so it will necessarily or almost always be a less protective a solution than if you were in a human rights privacy discussion so these trade-offs we need to bear in mind uh, these topics need to be included i think there's no coming back however we need to understand that data is much broader than trade so we need to have a space to bring together the trade community with the human rights community with the competition community to discuss data issues from a more holistic perspective and i wish good luck to the continental free trade area i think it's a tremendous opportunity to discuss data governance in the continent and it's the only way that uh, i think uh, african countries will make their voices heard on international negotiations if they can negotiate together collectively as an enlarged market because they are sometimes small in developing countries so i think it should definitely be included included just mind these connections that need to be made thomas thank you very much marilia um i see that isabel has the hand up she is watching the chat and apparently there seems to be an interesting question in the chat so if you can unmute yes thank you isabel please go ahead Yes, hello, thank you. So I have a question here from someone called Amir Mokaberi, I hope I'm saying their name right, from the Iranian academic community. And the question is, what is the relation between the unilateral coercive measures in the digital world and digital self-determination of nations, especially internet related scenarios in domains like access, digital resources, technology and capacity building that are being applied by some states against other nations? that could be a great barrier towards development goals and constitutes violations of human rights obligations. Thank you. Thank you very much again for this very interesting uh, question. Who would like to dare to give an answer? So again, it's a question that is gearing more towards let's say cultural and, and geopolitical differences and how we we deal with this in a global environment okay uh, I, uh, so i think when the issue happened with ukraine when the invasion of ukraine happened it showed it actually a gap in digital uh, governance globally uh, because the issue of sanctions came about and then we realized that we don't really have a set mechanism there in, uh, in dealing with sanctions because sanctions had some implications for the global internet uh, connectivity and uh, so we realized that there was a gap there now 
going back to this question and in relation to unilateral uh, sanction or action against a country, I think that's more of a political concept between the two countries. But on general, I think we need to discuss issue of sanctions on a far more general basis and come up with better understanding of sanctions that internet could within the within the data community we could impose or acceptable to impose. That area is I believe remains a gray area in terms of sanctions. I don't know if you help that or Thank, thank you. I think I've seen that Roger had his hand uh, up as well. And Roger, as, as a, a specialist on international law uh, from a foreign ministry, maybe you also have ideas about how to, to deal with, with the idea of or the, the, the fact that sanctions exist that limit uh, exchange. How, do we, how should we deal with this? And then maybe also uh, to, to ask you, what do you think where in addition to uh, at the WTO where we discuss the trade aspects, where would you maybe see that the discussion on data, on other aspects of data, including human rights, self-determination, where should we discuss this? I see UNCTAD is active. Uh, do we need to create a world, uh, a, a United Nations data organization or where do you see that we can, that we can bring all this together? Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, that's of course the, the big question uh, in the end um, where we should discuss uh, all the data governance issues um, I mean first of all I very much agree with uh, with uh, Marilia uh, that uh, it shouldn't be limited to trade uh, discussions um, then to the question of Amir um, first of all I just wanted to make one remark we make quite often in the sense that for us digital self-determination is not the same as digital sovereignty um, we try to to use this in a quite a distinct manner in the sense that at least in Europe there's a lot of discussion about digital sovereignty which means how a state can still be somewhere in control or in charge uh, also in the digital world uh, because there are uh, clear limitations to it um, but the approach with digital self-determination comes much more from an individual perspective and then it can be companies uh, bigger entities but it's not a discussion about sovereignty uh, fr from states um, and then finally the, where the discussion should take place uh, that's that's a very difficult one um, as we have the, this, the question from Amir I think uh, it's very important not to start with the geopolitical issues when we talk about data governance otherwise it will be immediately blocked um, so I think we should uh, try to find a space where geopolitics the geopolitical dimension is less uh, dominant than, than in others. Um, I mean, one area, of course, you mentioned UNCTAD, and that's an interesting avenue. I could imagine that we try also to get closer to, um, to the st statistical area. I think in statistics, there are a lot of interesting discussions on data ongoing and up to now I have the impression that there the, the political dimension is less less big than, than in other forums. Thank, thank you very much, Roger. And, and indeed, it is important to, to see the difference between uh, a notion of self sovereignty of a state that is able to defend him or her itself against maybe attacks or against dependencies and the self-determination of people that have that try to have control over their lives through keeping control over their data and of course co smaller companies and so on so that that is a complementary issue it's not it's not necessarily or it's definitely not the same and and thank you also for your for your point about we should try and go for 
for let's say less ideological ideological areas and start from a facts based uh, and i guess I, I take this as as that we know that we we just had the un world data forum that uh, uh, was uh, taking place last year uh, in, in Switzerland and there's the next one is already at the horizon I think it's somewhere in the Arab region um, so this is definitely a good hint that we could actually try and link um, those that deal with statistical data um, so in order to to bring these two communities together because also our, our experience on national level is that the statistical people uh, live in different worlds sometimes that those that deal with regulating or with human rights or with trade uh, aspects and it make would make sense to bring them uh, better together so i think this is a very this is a very good point to start with and again uh, of course this is not the start of the uh, this the end of this issue it's just the end of this session and i would like to thank you all encourage you all to to help us move this issue forward so that the the awareness on the importance of data governance uh, is, is, is still growing and that we find in addition to the IGF which is one important space but that we find more uh, additional uh, spaces where this is discussed uh, and when decisions are made that they are made on a basic of a holistic approach and not just on a, on a, with a particular view on something like trade or some, something else. So thank you very much for this uh, interesting exchange and uh, yeah looking forward to future exchanges. Thank you all online and present here in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Recording in progress.